Good evening, everyone. It is a Wednesday evening. We're so grateful you found time in your week. I should say you made time in your week because I know your weeks are full, and so we're grateful you're here tonight for this month of Wednesdays. Um, singing and preachers and time gathered together, and so to be in this house is a great gift to all of us, so we're good, so, so good to be gathered. Um, and have John and Billy tonight with us from Georgetown is a great gift too. So in this evening, um, there's a few things coming. Um, we'll be gathering with scripture and prayer, as you see. Um, we'll be singing together. Caleb Nabb's going to bring a bit of testimony about this phase in his life with God. Kim Watkins did not plan to sing, but she was rehearsing a song, and I thought it was for tonight, so I put it in the program. And then Kim got a program and discovered she was singing tonight. So Kim is singing tonight, so we're really great. We catch you singing around here, you're in the program. That's how that works. Um, so that'll be this evening and then preaching, but again, our gratitude. Um, it is a week where we again have lost in the community a handful of really large, large people, personalities. Um, uh, William Miller has gone, Larry. You know, just a hand, again, every week we've got a handful of people who have just shaped the community and been part of long friendships, and, and so it's hard not to think about um, how one life does shape a community and shape families, and so I, I would hope that as you think about other people, you realize that your life is larger than it feels. It is large, and a lot of people depend on you, so I would hope that you live that way. A lot of people need you to answer the phone. They just need you to answer the phone and be a voice for them, be a neighbor for them, a friend for them. So these losses we are going through these past few years that are so unexpected, um, we're mindful of our own lives as well. We're going to read scripture together from John 15. It'll be on the screen for us together. John 15 verses 1 through 5. Jay will give us that. We will um, read together. Join me as we read. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You join me, please, as we pray. Father, we pray to you in the name of the true vine. We pray to you as one who cares enough about us to care about us in ways we don't want you to care about us, to pay attention to us in ways we don't often want you to pay attention. We don't seek pruning. We accept it generally unwillingly and yet you continue to prune that we might be even more fruitful. We ask, Father, tonight for the faith to remain, to believe in the power of remaining, the call to remain, the hope to remain, the strength to remain, the help to remain. The God, we would see in Christ Jesus our truest fruit, our truest heart, our truest water, our truest future. God, may we confess that by ourselves we will not bear fruit. May we confess that we cannot bear fruit except by remaining in Christ the vine. And God, may you help us make the confession of Jesus Christ as the vine. And may we accept that you've only asked us to be the branches. And no more. Not the vine, but the branches. Father, we pray for fruit. We pray for wisdom, we pray for humility, but above all, we pray in thanks. By the power of the Holy Spirit, through the help of our Lord Jesus Christ, and because of your great love and grace toward us. 
Amen. hymns that we're going to be singing tonight. So if you're turning your hymn on, we're going to transition back to back for all of these. Uh, page 407, that's Because He Lives, we'll sing verse 1 and 3. And then we'll transition to He Lives, 1 and 3, on page 533. So 407 and 533. And then we'll close with the nice chorus of on page 23, God is so good. And we'll do verse 1 and 2. So page 407, 1 and 3, 533, 1 and 3, 23, 1 and 2. Along life's narrow way, 
I know you all are here to hear me talk, right? Um, I don't normally get very nervous up right there, but uh, my heart's beating pretty fast so uh, right now. Anyway, um, a couple weeks ago, uh, I went and saw a mo new movie. It's a superhero movie, and half the dialogue is in Chinese. And... Uh, if you can read subtitles, you can enjoy the movie and follow along. Now, behind me was a family of three. There was a mom, a son of four, and a son of eight. The mom was obviously there to take the eight-year-old, but the four-year-old, for a while, was okay with just watching the action. But eventually, he wanted to know what people were saying in Chinese, and most four-year-olds can't read. So I'd hear, Mom, what did he say? And then they go back to English, and he'd be okay. And then, Mom, what did he say? And I thought, why would you bring a four-year-old to see a movie? Obviously, he's not going to get it. And you know he's going to interrupt, so why not just take him away you know, out of the movie? Well, eventually, the mom got tired of summarizing this for the kid. And then the kid was like, Mom. I don't like this movie. And he wanted to go. But I thought about that and I thought, why am I so selfish? Why is it my enjoyment so important that my enjoyment of this movie should get in the way of me speaking up to this mom who so obviously wants to just take her kids out to see a movie? I still enjoy the movie with him talking, right? But I wanted to have control and I wanted it to be my way. But in my stage of life right now, I live by myself, I have no kids, and in my job, I'm really independent, so I can kind of do and go as I please. So when I wake up in the morning, I have the expectation that I'm going to have control of my day, uh, that the work that I do will get the amount of appreciation I think it deserves. Uh, I think I'm going to win my battles. Uh, I think I'm going to be the one calling the shots. I'm going to be able to pick and choose my interruptions. The people will want to know my opinion. And uh, I have regular thoughts to run through my mind like, I don't deserve this. There's no way that they're right. I could do a better job. No one else is working like I'm working. Uh, I need to correct them. 
I should be included in that. Why do I have to be the one with this responsibility? But that's such a foolish way to think, because my job is not to be in control. It's too easy to be selfish. It's too easy to have pride. It's too easy to put myself before others. It's too hard to consider others' opinions. It's too hard to walk in another's shoes. But we don't walk this path to follow God because it's easy. We do not follow God because it makes us happy. We do not follow God because it brings us wealth. Happiness, success, and winning cannot be the goal of a Christian. My goal, where I'm at, has to be to meet God wherever I can. What I've started to find is that meeting God in the easy places doesn't really help me much. The times where it makes the most sense to have the last word, to stand up for myself, to protect my dignity or my pride, when the opportunity arises for me to triumph over somebody else and metaphorically stand over top of them and say, I told you so, uh, when it's right in your face and pride and culture and tradition is screaming in your ear that I can and I deserve to win this one, God is standing right here whispering in your ear to lose. God is saying, give up yourself, your pride, your right, your privilege, your time, your success. Only ungrateful people complain and gossip. It won't, losing won't make you happy. It won't make you rich. It won't make you popular. And hardest of all, it won't make sense to your body. As long as I don't let God take control of my mind and body, it will fight to win. I will lie, I will cheat, I will steal, I will backstab, I will hate just to win. I've got to find the peace and wisdom that comes from letting others win. I can't take myself too seriously. I've never had it all figured out, and I never will. Uh, If I don't mess up about 5,670 times a day, it's a miracle. Uh, My church has never had it all figured out, and it never will. My country has never had it all figured out, and it never will. This is Matthew 21, 28 through 32. It's a parable of the two sons. A man had two sons. The man went to the first son and he said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And the son answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and he went. And then the man went to the other son and said the same. And the second, said, second son said, I'll go, sir. But he didn't. Then Jesus said, Which of the two did the will of his father? And the crowd replied with the obvious answer, the first. It doesn't matter that I don't enjoy losing because I'm not. It matters that I'm willing to. Just as Christ could have helped himself off the cross and been victorious on that day, he chose to lose and in doing so won. God is trying to teach me to lay down my sword, pick up my cross, shut up, and start walking to my defeat. That's where I'll meet God, and that's where he'll change me. So that's all I have. Thanks.
This is a song that I love dearly. Um, I Am Not Alone by Carrie Job. Some of you probably have heard it. Um, but it's a song that's near and dear to me because it really explains, um, you know, life. So often we feel alone. So often it doesn't matter if we're in a room full of people. So often we feel alone. Um, but in Christ, we are never truly alone. We have him. So um, huge reason I, I love this song, and I hope that it speaks to you tonight um, as I sing it, even when I might mess up. So please just take in the words, take in the lyrics, and just, just be reminded that Christ and that the Lord is right there with you every step of the way. If you'll just call him in and, and invite him into your days.
Well, I um, have a lot of treats in my pocket from the years I've been here at the church. A lot of um, friendships that came along the way you just never saw coming, and Dr. John Travis is one of them, one of them, just a very good part of my life. I'm grateful for his work, his story, and you know, he's right. He told me he really does have the most beautiful grandkids in the world, and he might. He might have seen them. He just might have the most beautiful grandkids in the world. So, um, in fact, one of my treats was getting invited. What, what was your anniversary? 25th anniversary, which was one of the best parties I've ever been to. That was a great, great evening of fun and his people. It was just a great treat for Jennifer and I to be a part of that. Um, but it's a great treat that he comes home. And um, many of you have grown up with John, and we're glad he's here, glad he brings his story from here, his story from there, but that we all share his story in Christ. So please come and bring us the word. Good evening. We greet you tonight in the name of our Christ who died that we might live and rose for our justification. Listen, it is a great privilege, and I, I am honored uh, to be here tonight to share with you uh, especially to see uh, persons that I don't get to see that often, um, but probably for their benefit. But I, I, am, I am grateful uh, to see my brother Dave Smith here tonight. Uh, we grew up together, and I have been blessed to be a part of that family. Uh, one of the, I discovered, I'm looking at a picture the other night, that I'm the shortest of the brothers. It used to be Toby. <laughs> but now I'm the shortest of the brothers. I am grateful for the opportunity to come and share with you tonight. I'm grateful for your pastor, uh, who is a tremendous believer in Christ, and I'm grateful to God for that and for the invitation to come and share with you. And it is a privilege. I was told by Dr. George Waddles some years ago, and he told us in an expository preaching class, that if you get the opportunity to preach to two people, it's more people than you deserve. And that's the way I look at it, and I'm grateful uh, to God for that. I want to share with you tonight uh, from one verse of Scripture from one of the 13 Psalms in the Bible with the superscription, Sons of Korah. They were believed to be among the chief Levitical families in the nation of Israel. And I do so tonight because my objective is to encourage your hearts in the midst of these trying times with a reminder of the greatest asset we have in our possession. Or really, I should have said, which possesses us, yet we often forget it and most times we neglect it. So if you would, turn in your Bibles, your iPad, your iPhone, or whatever you use to read Scripture, Psalm 46, verse 1. And as you are doing so, I am a preacher, therefore I preach. I am not a politician, so I am not politically correct. I'm not a speaker. I may not be grammatically correct. I'm not an entertainer. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm not a performer. I'm not here to give a performance. I'm not interested in prideful position, promotion, or praise. My aim is not to please you, to appease you, or to set you at ease. I'm not looking for affirmation nor confirmation from you to validate what I do. I'm a man called by God to preach the word of God. I preach it because I believe it. I believe it because it is divinely inspired and absolute. Therefore, I will not willingly compromise it. I will not dilute it. I will not refute it. I will not misuse it. I will not soften its message, usurp its authority, nor question its inerrancy. For God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my guide. My charge is to rightly divide the word in season and in out of season, and in seasons to come, so that when the chief shepherd shall appear, I will not be ashamed to stand before him. Psalm 46, verse 1. 
I'm going to read from Old Faithful King James tonight. He says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Speak, Lord, for we need to really hear from you. For we know that from you and through you and to you are all things. To you be glory forever. Amen. Tonight, we have entitled our message, No Progress Without Struggle. No progress without struggle. The great American abolitionist, statesman, orator, Frederick Douglass, on August 3rd, 1857, delivered a West India emancipation speech at Canandaigua, New York. And it was on the 23rd anniversary of that event. Douglas captured the sentiment of the event when he declared, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate education are men who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Listen, those great words are universal in scope as well as time, because the general sentiment of them may be applied to any number of situations we face in life. Tonight, I apply them to the continued stress of enduring this paralyzing, painful pandemic. And I might add, there is no doing without desire. There is no achieving without grieving to some extent. And as believers in Christ Jesus, there is no true victory aside from being in Christ. And in fact, that's what the big idea of this message is telling us tonight. God is greater than all of our troubles. And with that being said, we have to learn that there is no progress without struggle. Now, the greatness of this 46th Psalm is found in the fact that it was written during a time of overwhelming turmoil in Jerusalem. It is believed the setting for this psalm is during the time of Assyrian invasion of Judah, during the reign of King Hezekiah, which was a time of fierce trouble, and even so, God protected and gloriously delivered his people through it all. Now come here to me for just a minute. Because of the many lessons God is permitting us to learn during this time of pandemic politics and pain is that we must deal with struggle because it is inevitable. It may very well uh, be uh, for individuals. However, it also alters the way we view life. We learn not only what matters most in life, but more so who matters most in life. And, and we are learning to appreciate living, together with cherishing the freedoms that we may have been taking for granted. We couldn't move about. We couldn't go like we used to. Things that we have taken for granted. And God is getting our attention in this pandemic. And don't misunderstand me tonight. I'm not saying that God caused the pandemic. Because pandemics can occur because of a three-letter word, sin. We are therefore learning that adversity can be advantageous 
and pain can be profitable and problems can be promising. Furthermore, we learn how critical, how crucial, how vital it is to have a strong relationship with the Lord. And listen, I just got to tell you, I don't know what people do who don't have Jesus as Savior. I, I really, stop looking at me funny. Raise your hand or move your head. Let me know that you're still awake. Because if you don't have Jesus, life is crucially bad. And I love what the great preacher, Dr. Gardner Calvin Taylor, who has been called the Dean of American Preaching, I like what he says. He says, there are days when we can bring before God laughter of joy and gratitude. There will be other days when we can only muster a bitter, angry complaint. But confident, be confident, he says, that God will accept whatever we lift up before him and he will make it serve his purpose and our good. And likewise, I, I love the statement of the late great preacher, Dr. Timothy J. Winters of San Diego, California, who gave us this great insight before he passed on to glory. He said, if the problems you are struggling with require God's word for the solution, it was not your problem to begin with. It was God's. And, and I like that. I like that because it catches many of us where we are right now, struggling, suffering, shifting back and forth between fatigue, fear, and faith. So let me quickly say tonight, there is no one who is living or ever has lived who has not been faced with the invisible narrow circumscription of life that exists between struggling and progressing. There is no one who has exited this life having sojourned many days who have bypassed the pathway of personal predicament. I said, no one, no one is exempt from its clutches. Take again, the authors of this song, and especially the man whom the Bible declares is a man after God's own heart, the man named David. And you may only think of him as one who never struggled, strained, never complained. But listen, you, you got to keep reading uh, to learn the truth. Because case in point, Psalm 38, verses 16 to 22. Listen to what he says. I have prayed for deliverance because otherwise they will gloat over me. When my foot slips, they will arrogantly taunt me. For I am about to stumble and I am in constant pain. Yes, I confess my wrongdoing. And I am concerned about my sins. But those who are my enemies for no reason are numerous. Those who hate me without cause outnumber me. They repay me evil for the good I have done. Though I have tried to do good to them, they hurl accusations at me. Do not abandon me, O Lord. My God, do not Remain far from me. Hurry and help me, O oh Lord, my deliverer. Now listen to me. Because clearly, he also felt abandoned and alone, stressed, depressed, including overwhelmed at times. And yet, the difference is, in the midst of his fear, his anguish, and anxiety, he turns to God. While on the other hand, when we are in that situation, we only turn to pity and grief. And again, that's what the big idea of this message keeps telling us tonight. God is greater than all our troubles. And with that being said, we have to learn there is no progress without struggle. But, but if you need confirmation, listen. 
listen to his words in Psalm 3, verses 1 through 8. That's recorded in this sacred book for boasting and blessing as well as benefiting our development during discouragement. Let me put a pen right there. Because there are those who, uh, when they get in difficult situations, they want deliverance. When God may be intending development. That's why we are going through some things that we cannot understand, that we can't handle. But David said, oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. And listen, arise, O oh Lord, save me, O oh my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Listen, all he said was, if the Lord is on your side, who can be against you? Because salvation belongs to the Lord. And your blessing be on your people. So let me ask you tonight. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever in the midst of your pain and peril reflected back on an occasion, a juncture, or a moment in time when you learned it had to be God alone who brought you through? Have you ever in your praying started out complaining to God of your calamities and then end up celebrating God for the victories you have just then realized God has given you. Have you ever dreaded the thought of awakening to another day after a restless night of sleep that holds the probability of being miserable, intolerable, even unbearable? Yet, in spite of it all, you awaken the next morning with these words from the psalmist in Psalm 30 verse 5 on your lips and in your heart. Yes, for his anger lasts only a brief moment and good favor uh -huh, restores one's life. Look, one may experience sorrow during the night, but joy arrives in the morning. But that's only for those who are in Christ. Well, look, I would have you know, it's no different here with the sons of Korah. They knew God was with them. No matter where they went, no matter how far they had to run, no matter how high the odds were stacked against them, they knew God would deliver them, that God would protect them that God would save them. And listen, it's important for us tonight, for tomorrow or any time, to take note of there are no guarantees in this song. Look at it. Because the sons of Korah never ask for a kingdom. They never ask for their families to be restored. They never ask for things to go back to the way they were before the calamity. And yes, life will never be the same after this pandemic. You won't be able to go back to the way it was. That's because they realized that their hope is not in the outcome of their circumstances. You missed it. Their hope is in the Lord. And they trust God with their future. You, you didn't get me. They knew God would be faithful to his word. To work things according to the good pleasure of his will. And I like that. I, I like that. Because in many of the other psalms. They began with a description of the psalmist crisis. 
However, in this 46th Psalm, the psalmist begins with God's provision. He looked to God for help in difficult times, and in him, he found it. Okay, that went over your head too. Because you think that we are to find relief. That's not always what God is looking for. He wants us to find him. Yeah, and you're looking for help to meet your bills. But you should be looking for a savior and his will. He could say these things by experience. That God himself was a place of refuge. As the cities of refuge protected the frightened fleeing fugitive in Israel. That God himself was the puissance, power, and provision for his people. Being present for them and the best part, in them. That was God alone who was his refuge and strength. Not God in something or somebody else. That God himself was their help. Not from a distance, but a very present help. Especially in the time of trouble. Okay, you're not hearing me. Because one of the issues that plagues our existence as believers in Christ Jesus is the fact that we have not trusted him enough to try him. And then we haven't tried him enough to trust him. Dr. Gallagher, Calvin Taylor also says, there is a lesson to be learned in the house of sorrow that the house of laughter can never teach. Do you realize that a poor man can tell you more about God than a rich man? He knows that God can make a way out of no way. He knows that in the midst of his sorrow, that earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal. And with that being stated, there are two of Jesus' many important declarations of which we as believers in Christ, we must grasp them and be encouraged by them. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world does. Do not let your heart be distressed or lacking in courage. And, and, and then again in John 16, 33, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have trouble and suffering. But take courage. I have conquered the world. And, okay, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Because I know exactly what you're thinking right now. I, I know what's going through your mind. Because if we could muster a legitimate complaint with God, uh, it would be that we wished all of us who believed in him plus accepted the salvation so freely given in his Christ that we of all people would be resistant, released, relieved, or at least loosened, lessened, lifted above trouble, trial, and tribulation. And I hear you tonight, and I understand how you feel. But know this, you are not alone in your feelings of exasperation, frustration, and aggravation. Just like us, many are the servants of God who possess a faith much stronger than ours. Even so, who had to deal with doubt, depression, even devastation in situations that overwhelmed them. And, and that's our problem, uh, because we like to be in control. Uh, we, we like to call the shots. We want to set the rules of the game. But listen, take for instance, that old patriarch Job, who has been wrongly credited with being one who never lost his patience in trial. <laughs> that ain't true. That's not true. 
because it is not included in God's description of him. The, the Lord, look, says to Satan, to the Satan, and, and Job didn't know what was going on, but the Lord said to the Satan that there is no one on earth like Job. He is a pure and an upright man, one who fears God and turns away from evil. And in the midst of Job's most trying trial, God says to the Satan, still he holds firmly his integrity so that you stirred me up to destroy him without reason. Now listen to a summary of the one who you think had patience. Listen to his complaints. Uh, let the day perish in which I was born. Uh, he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not let me get my breath, but he fills me with bitterness. Though I am blameless, he would prove me perverse. Therefore, I say, he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When disaster brings sudden death, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. I call aloud, but there is no justice. Here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. <laughs> Listen to me. You, you may want him to answer you. But God will always let you have the first word. But you can rest assured, he's going to always have the last word. Now let me ask you, does that sound like a person who has been excluded from the realm of earthly sorrow? Shake. Despite everything, we have to learn there is no progress without struggle. And I'm almost through when I tell you this. At some point in our lives, we will face circumstances that we feel are more than we can handle. We, we will know the hollow, helpless feeling of being able to do nothing to change our situation. We may arrive at the point where the only progress we're making is moving backwards suffering more and understanding less. Well, you may not realize it, but that's an okay place to be in. Because to help us out tonight, the Lord has given us this 46th Psalm for times like these. And once again, the big idea of the message keeps telling us, God is greater than all our troubles. And we just have to learn there is no progress without struggle. The, the great psalm was uh, the inspiration for Martin Luther's great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. This is the answer to when facing devastating misfortune or overwhelming trouble. It is here we learn three directives we ought to do right there in the text confess number one God as your refuge and strength number two rest assured of God's presence and God's power number three be still wait and hope in the Lord the Lord he is God and I need you to know this tonight that God is always and I mean always ready to help us in times of trouble. But you don't get to dictate how he helps you. Stay with me now. Stay with me. He will enable you to conquer fear even in the midst uh, of the most catastrophic circumstances. And we should live day by day with the expectation as well as understanding that life in a sin-sick world is full of trouble. But we got to also realize, we got to also grasp and rejoice in the fact that our God knows us. He cares for us and will definitely take care of us if we believe, trust, and obey. 
and, and I know it appears at times as though God, whenever you call on him, he's either on vacation or he's hard of hearing or, or he puts you on hold or just plain unresponsive or non-respectful of what you are going through. But hold on. Because I also hear the psalmist declare in the 139th Psalm, O oh Lord, you examine me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I get up, even from far away, you understand my motives. You carefully observe me when I travel or when I lie down to rest. You are aware of everything I do. Certainly, my tongue does not frame a word without you, O oh Lord, being thoroughly aware of it. You squeeze me in from behind and in front. You place your hand on me. Your knowledge is beyond my comprehension. It is so far beyond me, I'm unable to phantom it. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee to escape your presence? If I were to ascend to heaven, you would be there. If I were to sprawl out in Sheol, there you'd be. If I were to fly away on the wings of the dawn and settle down on the other side of the sea, even there, you hand would guide me, your right hand would grab hold of me. If I were to say, certainly, the darkness would cover me. And the light will turn night all around me. Even the darkness is not too dark for you to see. And the night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You see, our problem is because of our disobedience. We lack understanding and it takes the light of the word of God in our hearts and minds to bring spiritual sight insight and understanding yeah yeah you 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 remember uh, the bible also says in job chapter 1 verse 22 uh, the king james version about the comments of job because you would think you know you you kind of bold to say things like you uh, have been saying about god and god let job talk from chapter 2 all the way up to chapter 38 but at 39, God said, okay, you said enough. Now let me ask you some questions. But look, the Bible says in all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. God said, you have been wanting your day in court. Well, I'm going to give you your day in court. But before you come before the judge, let me just ask you a few questions. Where were you? When I created this world, where were you when I told the ocean, come this far and go no further? Where were you when I told the seasons to change? And old Job said, oh, hold up, no need to continue with the court, Lord. I, I take back what I said. I didn't know what I was talking about. And listen, that's what I'm telling you tonight. I, I, I remind you tonight of the hymn of W.B. Stevens, Further Alone. And, and let me leave you with these words. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long while there are others living about us, never molested nor in the wrong. Further along, we'll learn all about it. Further along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Listen, even though we have to learn sometimes the hard way, that there is no progress without struggle. Or as my mama used to always tell me, a hard head to make a soft behind. Yet, if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, there is a promise during the progress. There is a satisfaction in the struggle. The writer of the epistle to the Hebrews in the 13th chapter and the 5th verse said, let your conversation, meaning your lifestyle, be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I don't know how you feel about it tonight, but that's also why I rejoice when the psalmist David declared in the 27th Psalm. And I just want to remind you of that before I take my seat. He said, the Lord is my light 
and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of praise. I'll sing, yea, I'll sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, seek ye my face, my heart said, Lord, thy face will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Neither leave me, O God of my salvation. Neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses have risen up against me, and such as brood, breathe out cruelty. I'm through now. I I'm finished. But, but I said all I needed to say tonight. But, but before I leave you, there's something else I want to tell you. There's something else that you need to see. Something else you need to hear. Something else that will encourage you. He says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Wake up now. Wake up. Wake up. Here this part. Don't miss this part. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Wait on him. Now, but hold up before you go. Hold it. Don't nobody move. Don't nobody move. We teach this at Maddox Town. I just want to share it with you tonight. There are three things and three ways that we respond. Anytime you hear the word of God preached, anytime you hear it being taught. There are three things that you do. Number one, it has to be meditation. Number two, it has to be reflection. Number three, it has to be application. In other words, here's what it is. It is broken down like this. What? So what? Now what? Now let me break that down for you. When you look at the what, the what is always the word of God because what is important is what God says. So the what is always the word of God. But then when you move from the what, it always goes to the so what. And the so what is where we come in because what it is is how is that word relevant to me? What is God saying to me from the what? What is he telling me to do? Is he commanding me? Is he comforting me? Is he scolding me? Is he warning me? So what is where I come in? But then after the so what, there is always the now what. Now watch this. The now what is this? Since I know what God is saying and since I have learned that God is talking to me, now what am I going to do? And that's the part that we come in. That's what we have to do. That separates the men from the boys, the girls from the ladies. Watch this. The what? The so what? The now what? The what is what you meditate on. The so what is what you reflect on, and the now what is the application. And before I leave you tonight, let me give you the application of what we just told you. Number, get your pencils out. Number one, won't cost you nothing. Number one, admiration leads to obedience of God. Admiration leads to obedience of God. When you admire him, you obey him. Number two, obedience leads to understanding the word of God. Obedience leads to understanding the word. Listen, why would you go to the doctor 
and he described for you what your situation is and he prescribes a remedy, why would you not do it? Why would you go pay the co-pay? Roll in the doctor and say, listen, there's something wrong with me. He's okay. Here's what you need. I'm going to write you a prescription. Go up here to Walgreens and get it filled. And you drive right by it. But that is exactly what so many people do every Sunday morning. When pastor stands to declare from the word of God, you are asleep or you're thinking, man, you got to hurry up. The game is on at 12 o'clock. But listen, obedience leads to understanding the word of God. But then thirdly, understanding leads to a deeper desire to learn more about God. Let me say it again. Understanding leads to a deeper desire to learn more about God. But here it is. The fourth one. Desire leads to a greater love for God. Desire leads to a greater love for God. Let, let, let me run back to them. Number one, admiration leads to obedience of God. Number two, obedience leads to understanding the word of God. Number three, understanding leads to a deeper desire to learn more about God. Number four, desire leads to a greater love of God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and God forever smile upon you. And I don't want to discourage you tonight, but I want you to understand, we're going to be in this pandemic until we learn the lesson or lessons that God is teaching us. And I hope that we stay in this pandemic. I hope it lasts long enough until we learn what God is showing us. Now be mad all you want and you can blame politicians and all that. That ain't the problem. Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against wickedness, in high places. And listen, the White House ain't high enough. What we are dealing with is spiritual wickedness in high places. And I just need to tell you, I'm through, I'm through. The devil is not red, horns, forked tail, and a pitchfork. In fact, if you turn your head to the right, you might be sitting next to him. Is Matt still here? Are you going to lead singing, Kim? Do we have a... Is Matt, is Matt left already? Kim will find a song. As we sing tonight, as I like to tell you that we... The idea that we are going to change everything, give everything, is fairly naive. The, the most far-reaching is what will change in the next 10 minutes, what we're willing to do when we get home. Um, I often leave church and have to contact someone and seek forgiveness, um, make connection. I often the very, very concrete decisions I make from a sermon that I've, that I've preached, that I've got to go home and do. And, um, and so I, I would tell you that. Uh, I would, something happened to me this morning. I pulled out a prayer journal I've got, and the, the one I'm using started three years ago. And, and when I started it, it was started out of desperation. Things were out of hand. Things were out of control. Things were out of control in families. And I just said, I've got to start writing these things down and dealing with them. And some of you in the room are in that book. And we were at places we just couldn't control and just didn't know what to do. It's interesting just watching how stories unfold over the years. And it's one of the benefits of paying close attention to your life and the things you pray for. And you get to see that 
for all the places we could do nothing but lose. And where we were willing to lose, God was doing things that were so beyond our control. So many of these stories have gone ways I could not have made up. But the Holy Spirit's creative. He is very creative. And so that's why we're hopeful. And so wherever you are tonight, and there are a lot of, you don't know this, but there are a lot of stories in the room that have open endings, and we don't know how they end. And so we may just be doing a little bit of this, but we're doing, we're shouting inside, asking for help. We're very white here, John. We're very white. We just kind of nod. But inside, we're dancing, John. Inside. We just know how silly we'd look actually dancing. Inside, we're dancing because we've all got stories. We don't know how they end. So thank you so much for tonight. We're going to sing a song of invitation this evening. It's a time for saying yes to God in whatever form or way you've heard God ask you to say yes. Every yes begins a path you, you absolutely need to walk. I remind you again, there are ways you are serving in this world and you are the only one in line. There's no one behind you. And so where you are keeping promises, you are saying yes, it's, it's you. And so you've got to keep saying yes to God for the way he's asked you to serve. If you'd stand with us, please, for this time of invitation, Kim's going to lead us in singing. Him number 275, I Surrender All. As we close tonight, I want to qualify something I said earlier about um, 
Dr. Travis's celebration at his church, and I called it a party, and it was. There was just so much joy. I just absolutely, um, Jennifer and I watching his family and his church just celebrate what was right. And it was, just celebrating what was right and all those decades together, it was such a grand evening. And so there is, in this church, his church, all of our churches, a great reason to celebrate what's right. And that the Holy Spirit does work among us that should absolutely be praised. And we are grateful to have these friends with us tonight. Your church is life, this church is life. So there's a lot that's right with the church. <laughs> there's a lot that's right with the church, trust me. And so um, we celebrate that tonight too. So thank you, thank you Billy, thank you everyone for all your work this evening. Caleb Nabb, Chairman of Deacons, would you please close us in prayer? We'll be dismissed.